Hi, my name is Lee Asplund and I'm the Regional Sales Engineer for the Hamilton Company in Process Analytics. I want to welcome you to my webinar today on dissolved oxygen measurements in bioprocess. This has been created for Laney College and for Doug Bruce and his class in biomanufacturing. If you have any questions following this as you watch recording or just rewatch this at all, please feel free to drop me an email. My contact information is right here. I'm always here if you have questions and connect with me on LinkedIn if you're interested as well. I work specifically in the process analytics division of Hamilton. We have many different divisions that if you continue your career in bioprocess, you will run into us from liquid handling to uh, cold storage of final product. And what I work on is the process analytics technology division. So as you move through your career in bioprocess, you will run into, especially if you move into anything with GMP manufacturing, something called the PAT initiative. And the PAT initiative talks to you about the process analytics technology. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on that, but as a really high overview, what it means is you need to know what's going on in your bioreactor at all times so that you can predict what will happen and ensure that you have the same product produced every time reliably. Same quality, same quantity, everything. So what we're gonna talk about today is dissolved oxygen measurements. And what I'm gonna encourage you to do, if you have any questions, is to go ahead and put your questions either in the chat window or in the question and answer panel. And Doug is going to do me the favor of letting me know if there's a question and even interrupting me if it's relevant to what we're talking about right then. If not, I'm happy to do questions and answers at the end. If you don't have questions, that's fine. But if you do have questions and you don't ask the questions, that's on you because this is a really great opportunity for you guys to learn, okay? Now I'm going to suggest strongly that you make sure that you use uh, in the view window, you wanna make sure you're looking at presenter view because I use what's called a virtual setup. So I don't share my screen. I switch between multiple cameras. So I can show you things like the demo equipment I have in the back when we wanna look at oxygen probes in a little bit closer, or we'll talk about the PowerPoint, okay? So again, if you have any questions, raise your hand or even just better, type it into the question and answer window or the chat window, I am here to help you. You'll also have my contact information at the end of this presentation and you are welcome to drop me an email if you have questions, I'm happy to help you. And I believe that this is being, um, I know we're recording it and I'm getting a copy to Doug and I believe you are planning on putting it up on YouTube or something again, like the PH one. So you'll be able to catch it there as well. If you are so enamored with what I've said and you wanna to listen to another hour and a half presentation down the way. So let me scoot my window just a second. There we go. Now I may or may not see any questions you guys put in chat, so please Doug, do interrupt me if there's something that is either in chat or Q&A that I should be aware of. Okay, so we okay. have dissolved oxygen measurements, okay? Simple, easy, but let's go back to the really foundational information that we're gonna talk about, which is oxygen. And you're sort of stuck with it because I'm a chemist by training and even worse, I'm an organic chemist by training. So this is right in my sweet spot. And basically what we wanna look at is a little understanding of what oxygen is because that really impacts what it does in our body. So an oxygen is eight electrons, eight protons and eight neutrons. It likes to live as a pair. So that's where you get the O2 bond and it is technically a double type bond between the two oxygen molecules. This is important because it needs two things to attach to. In this case, it attaches to itself twice. If you're looking at combining with carbon, like we do in carbon-based life forms, um, one oxygen can combine either to one or to two uh, carbon molecules and things like that. So just some things to think about within our world, 
it's absolutely necessary for life for most life it's uh we start with oxygen it's the most important gas it's about 21 percent of what we breathe the other 79 percent ish is nitrogen i say ish because we have helium and argon and co2 and all sorts of other stuff in the air but roughly 21 percent of its oxygen keep that in mind because when we think about a saturated oxygen environment which is something you think about a lot in biotech and when you're in bioreactors, that actually means 21% oxygen because that is a saturated oxygen environment. Um, it's necessary for cellular respiration. So unless your organisms or critters, as I like to call them, um, are anaerobic, they need oxygen to live. It's used in the mitochondria as part of the generation cycle. So if you're anything like me, when I was back in school, I memorized the ATP and Krebs cycle every single semester I had it because it had no relevance to me outside of school until I got in the real world and I actually had to know all those things. But oxygen is critical to that as well. Okay, just a really high level. This is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how we measure oxygen then the process of measuring oxygen and what happens in a bioreactor. We're going to talk about the two kinds of oxygen measurements that are available in a probe format. One is polarographic, the other is optical. We'll talk very high level about how you calibrate probes and some implementation options. Um, this is going to be pretty light on this end, just so you're aware when you go into the world and you get a job, there's going to be a lot of different implementation and while you won't remember a lot of what I talk about there, you will, it'll ring a bell down the road when you hear about the different types of implementation. Okay, so how do we measure oxygen? Well, let's think about first the properties. Oxygen is colorless and odorless. It oxidizes. This is why we have CO2. And when it's in the presence of metals, it forms oxides. When it's dissolved in water, which is what we care about most in bioreactors, it's called dissolved oxygen. And its solubility depends on a lot of things. It, not all solutions are created equal. In fresh, clean water, you can get about 8.3 milligrams of oxygen per liter at 25 degrees. And that solubility actually decreases when you increase the temperature. So let me explain that in just a second more because that is sort of counterintuitive. If you were to take a glass of water and put sugar in it, it's easier to get that sugar to dissolve if you warm up the water. But oxygen and dissolved gases are the exact opposite. The warmer the water, the less soluble. Think about a can of soda. On a warm summer day when you open it, it sort of blows up everywhere. But on a cold day, it just gives that little sound because everything stays dissolved the colder it is, okay? Where do we measure oxygen then? Well, in pharma and biotech, we care about it in the processes we do, in some of the ingredients we use. You need to know how oxygenated your waste products are, by the way. You need to know if it's going to go back into the sewer system or the water, it has to be returned within a certain pH and a certain oxygen concentration. If you're a beer drinker or a wine drinker, you want to know the oxygen levels because it impacts the shelf life of the beer and wine. Wastewater, I just spoke about. Aquaculture. If you're making fish tanks, you need to know how much oxygen is there so that your fishes are alive and in many other things. But today, especially in lieu of what you're class is about, we're going to talk about oxygen in bioprocess. And don't stress about scrambling to take notes or screenshots. I will send a copy of the PowerPoint presentation to Doug to distribute through for all you guys so you don't have to try and frantically take notes. It doesn't mean you can fall asleep. It just means you don't have to frantically take notes. So where do we measure in an upstream and downstream process? If we think about the upstream side, you'll measure oxygen in the bioreact or sorry, in the media prep sometimes, depending on what you're doing. You definitely measure it in the bioreactor. You measure it in the seed tank. Downstream, um, you'll measure it in possibly your centrifuge. Um, 
and you will measure it in your harvest tank in that, which is sort of where you get the upstream downstream split off. So this is a cool diagram because it also tells you all of the other process analytic technology measurements that good manufacturing practices require you or understand, expect you to know at each point. So we talk about pH and conductivity throughout the process as well. So the most important thing ever is how do we measure dissolved oxygen? Okay, well, that's a funny thing. It's considered a critical process parameter, but we don't actually measure oxygen directly. Instead, what we measure is the partial pressure of oxygen. We go back to, if you remember way back when, to dissolved gas laws, we think about partial pressures. And what we find is that the concentration of dissolved oxygen is actually proportional to the partial pressure of oxygen. Okay, So if we look at that in a more picturesque sort of way, and remember back to our days of physics, partial pressure is equal to the sum of all, or just the pressure of a single gas in a mixture of gases. So the total pressure is equal to the sum of all of the partial pressures. And oxygen is only one aspect, okay? So what else is included? Well, uh, the partial pressure of oxygen, you also might have dissolved CO2, you might have dissolved nitrogen, you have sugars in your bioreactor, you have cellular waste, you have all sorts of other things that you make you put in to make your cells happy, to harvest. All of those things hold an impact on the solubility and the partial pressure. When we're thinking about oxygen, the partial pressure is equal to the concentration of oxygen times the pressure of the air. So if we think about um, X equals 20.95% by volume oxygen, when you're thinking about it in the air, the partial pressure of dissolved oxygen is at times the partial pressure of air or the total pressure. Atmospheric pressure has a significant impact on this. Okay, So if you were to take a bioreactor and you were going to measure it in San Francisco, and then let's just pretend for a second that Star Trek's really real and we can teleport all that bioreactor with all the sensors to the top of a mountain in the Swiss Alps. And we take this measurement with nothing's changed. All we've done is change the atmospheric pressure. You will actually get a very different dissolved oxygen reading because the height above sea level or the atmospheric pressure significantly impacts the solubility of oxygen. This is one reason why when you get a new oxygen sensor, you will often need to calibrate it because it is unlikely that it was calibrated at a factory that has the exact same atmospheric pressure than where you're using it. So the next thing we need to think about is we have a bioreactor, we have stuff in solution. We care about the dissolved oxygen in solution, but um, what else does that mean? Okay. Well, we know that there's an equilibrium factor and the gases will go out into the air and then they'll dissolve back into water. And then they'll go out into the air and they'll dissolve them back into water. That's a nice equilibrium. So understanding what the partial pressure of oxygen is in the air will tell you what the partial pressure of oxygen is in the water because they have to be equal. It's an equilibrium state. Unless you are pressurizing the atmosphere and driving that into a non-equilibrium state, in most bioreactors and bioprocess, you're not doing this under pressure, therefore you're doing it in an equilibrium state. That also means that if you decrease the volume of your container, you're increasing the pressure in and that will change the equilibrium state. So why do you care about any of that? Well, again, the concentration of oxygen is proportional to the partial pressure. And that depends on the type of liquid, what's in it. The solubility of oxygen in dissolved water very much depends on, I talked about atmospheric pressure. 
but it also depends on what else is in solution. So if we just look at pure water, we can get eight milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen. If we look at a saline solution like KCL, and we do add saline into our buffers, that has a much less soluble. Um, so salinity decreases solubility of oxygen. Apple juice, apple juice has sugar. Think of that as sugar water. That is less soluble than water, but more soluble than salt. But ethanol, ethanol increases the solubility significantly. So if ethanol is a byproduct of your bioprocess, you can actually cause an increase in oxygen as things go on. And if you're using anaerobic critters and you're producing ethanol, where oxygen is poisonous to the critters, then you may need to do some things as your reaction progresses to reduce the oxygen in so you do not ultimately kill your cells. And that's really why we care about dissolved oxygen because it's all about whether or not we keep our cells alive or dead. And of course, alive is preferable. So this is just another simple chart about things that impact dissolved oxygen. And like I said before, temperature is huge, right? So the warmer the temperature, you decrease the solubility of dissolved oxygen and salinity decreases. The other thing we need to think about a little bit is the solubility of oxygen in air. And why do we need to think about that? Well, if you remember back to the bioreactor, I talked about there's an equilibrium state between what's soluble in water or in your media and in the air. And there's an equilibrium between those two. That's important. But even more important is how do you calibrate probes? Well, a little bit of a spoiler alert you calibrate oxygen probes in the air. And that's great, except in California, especially with air conditioning, we tend to be pretty dry. And the air that the equilibrium state is in a bioreactor is in a closed vessel of liquid, and that air is very humid. And we're measuring in dissolved liquid. So if you calibrate in dry air, you're failing to take into account the contribution of humidity in the solubility of oxygen. Remember, it's a partial pressure measurement. So you need to understand the effect of humidity on your calibration, because that will impact how you do your calibration, which will ultimately impact how accurate your final measurement is, okay? And I'll show you a little bit more about that later as well. But this curve just gives you some ideas about how the warmer you get, the humidity has a significant impact on solubility. Ah, there we go. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk about very briefly, what do cells need from a bioreactor? What does a bioreactor actually do? Well, other than being a home where the cells are cultivated, the bioreactor provides a controlled environment where you can have sensors placed in it. You can have tubing that allows nutrients to go into it through filters. You can take sterile samples out. You can, if you look on the inside of it, you can have things, there's impellers. These impellers cause stirring. Stirring and impellers is actually a very interesting and important part of a bioreactor. Impellers, you bubble oxygen in, and in this diagram, you can see that there's a sparger right here. The sparger bubbles oxygen in or air, depending on what you're using, into solution. So you get lots of little bubbles. Impellers not only mix up an ingredient so that you have an equilibrium state, but in addition to that, they form a very vital and important function, which is to break up bubbles. And they break up big bubbles into little bubbles and little bubbles into even smaller bubbles. And the smaller the bubble, that is when the oxygen is truly dissolved in the liquid. 
And that is when oxygen is taken up into a cell. So we start with a gas phase, either because we're sparging or from the air. It moves into the liquid phase as bubbles, okay? The impeller blades do an amazing job of breaking those bubbles into little bubbles and little bubbles into even littler bubbles, which allows the cells to uptake the oxygen. And I'm sure at some point, if you haven't already done this, Doug or somebody at your college is gonna to talk to you about oxygen uptake rates and KLA, which is the oxygen mass transfer coefficient. If you're working with bioreactors this year, it's really important because that tells you how efficient you are at getting the oxygen into the cells and keeping the cells alive and allowing the cells to undergo their energy creation through ATP and the Krebs cycle, okay? Why do we care about dissolved oxygen? Well, this is a signal growth curve for cells. At the early part, there's not a lot of oxygen demand. You're starting to get going. Suddenly you're in a growth curve and you have a lot more oxygen because your cells are multiplying. They're growing, you're getting more concentration of cells. Then you're sort of at a stationary phase where the number of cells being born or equivalent to them being a, that are dying. So you pretty much have a stable cell concentration. Your oxygen then becomes a limiting factor. If you don't have enough oxygen, you limit the total number of cells that can stay alive in your culture. And at a certain point, your cells start dying. And again, you lose oxygen. So surprisingly, or not surprisingly, your oxygen demand mimics your growth curve. And if looking at this in just another way, and the bioreactor and aeration, we have an impeller on the bottom. In this case, they could be from the top. It doesn't matter how they're driven. And there are different kinds of impellers that are optimized for different kinds of cell cultures. We're not going to go into that here. Just be aware that it exists. You have a sparger. Usually they are at the bottom, which is at a controlled flow rate. The sparger comes in and bubbles things in. Okay, so you have all sorts of bubbles. Your impeller is stirring and it breaks those bubbles from big bubbles to little bubbles to even smaller bubbles. You're adding in your C, you're monitoring CO2, pH, maybe CO2. There's all sorts of offline analysis. There's metabolite. And you might even be adding things like anti-foam depending on what's going on. And often you'll have an overlay of an airflow rate as well. So you have headspace pressure, that's driving gas into a solution. You have bubbling through. All of this is about aeration. And most bioreactors are only at a very slight positive pressure. So it's really important to understand how your oxygen uptake is in cells. And by measuring what's still dissolved, that tells you if your cells are going to be in a healthy condition or not. Okay. So process measurements of dissolved oxygen. There are four ways that oxygen is measured within a bioprocess. The first is what we call offline measurements. Um, examples of this are something called a lecture bottle. Um, it's a stainless steel bottle. It does GCMS analysis. It grabs headspace oxygen off. Remember the partial pressure of oxygen in the headspace should equal that's what's dissolved in an equilibrium state. So if you take an oxygen sample out of the bioreactor and you run it over to GCMS, that should give you a good indication of where your oxygen measurements are. There are portable oxygen meters. They're okay. They are not the highest in quality. They have they do have interference um, because they're open to the air. So you're taking a measurement out of the bioreactor and you're trying to measure it offline. Um, you may end up with oxygen from the room impacting that measurement. So this is pretty rarely done. And to be honest, the lecture bottles are not seen very often. Those are a, an older version of measurements. At line is where you're not taking an offline sample exactly, but you have something connected to your bioreactor, maybe a GCMS through a continuous loop. It's doing spot checks, but it's not open to the environment ever. Literally everything is connected and you're doing flow through. In breweries and at line, 
um, will connect to your um, bright tank of your brewery and you actually just run beer through this directly out of the tank. So it's a sealed system and you can measure the oxygen in the beer. We don't do this in bioreactors because you will spill a couple liters of beer on the floor when you do this. And in a bioreactor, a couple liters of media and culture could be the equivalent of tens of thousands of dollars of wasted product. But it is done in some industries. The two most common measurements you find for oxygen within a bioreactor or in the bioprocess scheme are called online measurements or inline, okay? Online would be like a blue sense oxygen sensor or a combination with a bioprofile flex. What that does is it takes a small, one of these tubes, I don't know which one in this one, but just to pretend, one of these tubes will be connected to a sensor and you're constantly just monitoring oxygen online. So it's a fairly real-time measurement or they're burst measurements, but they are in a sealed environment, okay? In small tabletop bioreactors like this, you don't generally do an online measurement. Uh, for that, we're talking about the really large ones that have huge tanks, 1500 liter, 10,000 liter, 50,000 liter. They might have a little oxygen sensor on the side of the tank that's actually monitoring the headspace. And then there's inline measurements. The cool thing about inline measurements is they are real time and they are consistent. So I'm gonna give you an example of why that's really important. I'm gonna pretend that you are all gonna be highly responsive to what I'm gonna ask right now. And maybe you will, please put it in chat. But does anybody here ever watch movies? Is anybody a fan of Marvel? You know, Avengers, things like that. Yay, we have a yes. Cool. All right. I'm going to pretend everybody there says yes, because it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. We're going to talk about the Avengers now, because I am a huge geek. Okay. I'm not going to give you any spoilers in this, but let's just pretend we're going to watch the Avengers right now. And I'm going to tell you the difference between taking a grab sample from your bioreactor or inline measurements. Okay. I think we can all agree that Avengers has a great soundtrack, has great costumes, really amazing special effects, lots of action. Now, that's an inline measurement. You get to sit down and watch that whole two and a half hour movie in a theater with surround sound and popcorn and you get to hear everything, see everything, big screen or even at home, doesn't matter. But if you're gonna take a grab sample a spot measurement. Instead, you don't get to watch Avengers. We're going to take a picture with no sound every half hour during that two and a half hour movie. So one at the beginning, 30, one hour, one and a half hours, two hours, two and a half hours, six pictures. And that's the, all you get to see about the movie. You get to flip through a book with six pictures. You miss all the action between. You have no context as to why Vision is lying on the ground. Is he snapping? Is he dead? Is he alive? Did somebody punch him? Was there a fight? Who knows? Don't know. He's just lying on the ground. In one of the Avengers, you see them all in the air ready to fight. That's a snapshot. You have no idea where they are what they're doing, why they're there, but it looks like it'd be fun, but no idea what happened five seconds later or five seconds before. That's what a grab sample is, an offline measurement, an atline measurement, and sometimes an online measurement. They are snapshots. The only real difference between a grab sample and an atline or an online is the frequency of measurement. They're not generally continuous measurements. They're usually quick snapshots. They're just much faster than you would see any other time, okay? So with that, process probes that can give you continuous measurements all the time, like a movie, are the best possible of all worlds because they 
allow you to see what's going on always. They sit inside your bioreactor from the moment you start and they feed you continuous data all the time. They give you a full picture. And when we're talking about oxygen measurements, that full picture is generally either done with a polarographic oxygen probe or an optical oxygen probe. The very first commercially available oxygen probes on the market were polarographic. And they are still found in a lot of places, especially in manufacturing, because if you are manufacturing a drug or something that is FDI regulated, they had to prove that this was safe and reliable. And in order to change from one type of sensor to another, you can't just change it like you might, you know, if you're at home and you don't like your one outfit, you just grab something else from the closet and you go, you don't have that flexibility when you're in a regulatory environment in manufacturing. You have to verify and validate that this probe has the same results as this probe. So if I want to use this probe instead, I have to prove that this is just as good as this, will give me the exact same data as this, and then I can change. I can't just swap without. If you're in R&D, you can change however you want because you're not mandated under regulatory. So polarographic is very, it's not found very much in R&D or it's reducing, fewer people are using it. Um, whereas optical oxygen tends to be more found in R&D and it's moving its way through. So let's talk about polarographic oxygen. Polarographic oxygen is really a redox reaction. If you've ever heard of somebody talk about a Clark electrode, an electrochemical oxygen, polarographic oxygen, or a membrane electrode, those are all the exact same thing. They're just different words for the same exact tool. And what it is, it's a redox reaction. So I don't know if you had a teacher like I did, but the way I always remember redox reactions is by this stupid little phrase that I was taught way back when called Leo the lion goes grr. L-E-O, loss of electrons oxidation. GER, G-E-R, gain of electrons reduction. You're welcome. You will probably never forget Leo the Lion Goes Gur if you hadn't heard it before then. It's a really easy way to remember electrochemistry though. So in this case, oxidation and reduction, and they can't occur. One has to occur in the place of the other. You can't have them isolated. So in an oxygen probe, in a polarographic probe, what happens is you have a platinum cathode and you have oxygen. And the oxygen is reduced on the platinum cathode. So you, oxygen loses electrons, no, oxygen, sorry, gains electrons to make hydroxide. And that happens at the platinum electrode. And the electrons that they need comes from the oxidation of silver. Silver loses electrons, becomes silver ions. This redox reaction causes a current to flow because we have electron flowing and electron flow is the definition of electricity. Okay. So this is how a polarographic sensor works. You have all of this happening inside of a sensor. In this case, guess what? This is a polarographic sensor. So we have oxygen, it diffuses through a membrane, gas permeable membrane, and there's liquid here. There's your electrolyte. We're applying a voltage across so that we can have all of this happening. We have a platinum cathode and a silver silver chloride, an silver, silver chloride anode. The chemistry we just saw here happens and we end up with a current, a nanoamp current. And conveniently, the voltage between the anode and the cathode happens to be called a polarization potential. And it just happens 
that oxygen becomes fully reduced at the cathode and no other gases are affected. And since oxygen is the only gas affected, this means that the current is proportional to the partial pressure of oxygen, which is proportional to the concentration of oxygen. And you get these really cool little curves here, but it's very much a linear correlation when you look at oxygen. Okay. So let's look at the components of a polarographic probe. We have a membrane cap. Now, I get bored looking at PowerPoints over a while, so I'm going to switch back and forth here for you. But what you see in a membrane cap is this sort of grid-like area here. That's what this looks like. There's a wire reinforced silicone layer with Teflon on top for permeability inside of this cap. Okay, so if we look here, I'm going to move this out of the way. These are polarographic oxygen caps. This end is the membrane and they're just hollow. Okay, simple, easy, hollow. The other part of a probe, and I'm just gonna go back to my back station. So we have, this is the whole probe. Okay. These are 12 millimeter probes. This is standard within bioprocess. Pretty much all sensors are 12 millimeter. And the fitting on the probe is what's called a PG 13.5. All bioreactors use the same thing. Okay. Inside of this, if I was to take this apart, which I won't, if I take the probe off, there's liquid in here. This is the electrolyte. Okay. And inside of that, Actually, go ahead, I'll take it apart. I'm just gonna keep this upright though, because there is liquid. Is what This is what it looks like inside. And this is what's called the anode cathode assembly. Okay. So what does an anode cathode assembly look like? Well, conveniently, I happen to have one right here. There's tiny little wires on the end here, that's platinum. And this is the silver, silver chloride. Okay. When you put all that together, you get a nano amp signal out of the system. And that gives you a measuring loop, okay? So you have a controller and a cable and that goes to your sensor. And this gives you a nano amp loop and you have to con calibrate all of this, including the cable and the controller to your bioprocess or to your bioreactor. Because every controller has different impedance, every cable has a different impedance and your sensor is different because of all the components. It's actually a very fragile measuring system. So if we look at the inside in this diagram, there's the cap I told you about. There's the anode cathode assembly, okay. You can see the very fine wires. Those are the silver silver chloride wires. And there's actually a very tiny point at the top. That's where the platinum comes out. This is a pretty fragile system. And the reason why we stop using these is because they're very maintenance heavy. This membrane needs to be replaced regularly because the diffusion potential for oxygen across that membrane will change with age. Okay, so you don't get the same oxygen diffusion you did the first day as you did the last day. Next, let me talk to you for a minute about the electrolyte. Oxygen is not the only gas that can cross this membrane. Any gas can. And what's another gas that's produced in bioreactors? CO2. It's the byproduct of cellular respiration. What happens when you add CO2 to water? It makes something called carbonic acid. And carbonic acid is going to change the pH of your media, which is why you are constantly measuring pH and you're constantly doing things to tweak and adjust your pH and keep it within a certain range. 
that's really important to understand because CO2 can also crawl in side of your polarographic probe where there's electrolyte, which is water-based. And as the CO2 goes inside, it can change the electrolytic strength or the pH of the electrolyte inside of the probe, which changes its ability to read a voltage signal. As it becomes more acidic, which is what happens with CO2, the ability of the electrolyte to read the voltage decreases. Normally, if you saw a lower voltage reading, you would think that means less oxygen. But if you were never measuring oxygen at all and you just change the pH of that electrolyte, it will also read a lower voltage. And that's not due to reduced oxygen, it's due to a change in the probe. Which means these sensors over time will start to artificially read lower oxygen, even in the same, if you maintain consistent oxygen levels. So that's something to think about because your process itself affects the probe. Next, the anode and the cathode can become damaged or corroded by oxidation. It's a redox reaction. Naturally, these do get used up over time. You can replace the anode and cathode in some manufacturers' polarographic probes, but not all. These probes are actually considered consumables. If not the whole probe, definitely the components of the probe. But as those anode and cathode change in shape, in uh, health, it will affect the ability for these to take consistent good measurements. There are some maintenance things you can do to compensate for that, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Also, the installation can really influence the signal. These are filled with liquid. You need liquid to fill through everything in order to get a closed circuit. If you put polar graphic probes upside down, you end up with an air gap where the platinum is. And that means you cannot have a complete circuit with your redox reaction. And so these probes can never be actually measured upside down. In fact, you need them to be at least 15 degrees angle off of, they can't be straight either because there's too much of an air gap. You need at least 15 degrees off the horizontal to get reliable measurements, okay? And finally, polarographic probes make uh, nanoamp signals. Nanoamp signals are weak. And that means they're very susceptible to noise from the environment. In fact, so much so that if I was to take a cable and click it with my finger, and it's a nanoamp signal, and you're watching the display out of the reading, you'll actually watch every time I thwack it with my nail, you'll watch a spike in the signal. Well, obviously in a lab, you're probably not gonna go around flicking cables. But let me tell you what does happen. Your bioreactor's here and your controller's here. And between those two, maybe you have an oven. Maybe you have a couple pumps that are feeding in acid or base to your bioreactor to maintain a stable pH. Maybe they're pumping in food because you're feeding glucose to your cell culture. That pump has a vibration. The cable is running right next to the pump, which is vibrating, which is kind of like a series of tiny little flicks. So the environment that you're in can be influenced or can influence the signal read, not the actual measurement, but the reliability of the signal. Nanoamp is very weak. This is not necessarily valid on short cables, but anything over about 10 meters has a significant impact, okay? So you need short cables for this to be reliable. We already talked about that. Apparently I have multiple copies of the slides. Okay. Membranes over time also get old and they need to be disposed of. There's a couple things that we need to take into account with that. So the first one that you see on the left is the chipped membrane. Over time, in process, in function, in usage, these will get chipped and that's just age. 
you generally only get a couple months of lifetime for a, the cap of these probes. Cracked membranes happen when you place these probes down on a surface. That mere act of putting them on the surface can cause tiny micro cracks. Why is that important? Well, that ties into the third one. How do you sterilize sensors for use in a bioreactor? Anybody have any ideas? Put it in, your in the chat window. What do you use to sterilize your probes in your bioreactor so that you don't grow any magic pixie dust that you don't want to grow? Does anybody know? Autoclave, that is one way, yes. Anybody know any other ways to sterilize your probes? Microfilter, no, that's not really a good way to do sterilization. Ethylene gas, not so much in bioprocess. Um, some sort of solution, right. So in small R&D bioreactors, you autoclave them. Um, the bioreactor that I just showed you down here, you would actually never autoclave. This is what's called a single use bioreactor and the sensors that are usually hard mounted in it come with the bioreactor as one unit and this comes in a special bag. And this whole thing has been gamma irradiated. They're more expensive. You're probably not gonna run into them in school but you definitely run into them in industry and single use is kind of cool because you never use these more than once, cleanup's easier, but they're gamma irradiated at manufacturing, so they come clean. These are what are called traditional probes and they go through autoclavation in R&D, but also if you're going to large scale like 1500 liter or 15,000 liter, there's a process called steam in place. And steam in place, it's kind of cool. Uh, your probes live in the bioreactor and at between runs they do rinsing and then they heat with steam and pressure the entire bioreactor, basically like an autoclavation, only they do it in place. So it's steam in place. And that's something you find in industry or scale up. So those processes, autoclavation and steam in place, cause wear and tear to all the components, which is another thing that reduces their lifetime but you kind of have to do them because if you don't do them, you end up with a problem where you grow something you don't mean to and you have to throw out whole processes. The thing is, when you do autoclavation, it's heat and pressure. When you do steam in place, it's heat and pressure. And the liquid inside of a polarographic probe, what happens to liquid when it gets hot? It expands. And if you have a crack in your membrane, or if you overflow and you add too much liquid inside the polarographic probe, when you add heat and pressure, what happens? The liquid expands, but if there's too much liquid, the liquid has to go somewhere and it does what's called a ripped membrane and it bursts out of the end of the membrane and blows up. If you're lucky, it happens when you're in autoclavation or when you're in steam in place. But generally what really happens, because Murphy's Law is never that kind to you, is it gets a micro crack and then you put it into your process and you add your cells and you do all the other things that you add in and it starts running and it breaks once you get everything loaded in and you lose all the electrolyte from the cell and the probe breaks in and you can no longer do measurements and depending on what you're growing, you might have to throw everything out. So that's another problem. So it sounds like there's a lot of things that can go wrong in polarographic, and there are, but there's some maintenance you can do on polarographic probes after every single run to minimize any of the risk. And I'm gonna go over this quickly. You'll have the slides, reach out if you have questions. But after every single run, and I'm going to define a run as I put this in a bioreactor, I put the whole thing into an autoclave, I autoclave it, I come back out, I add my cells, I add my culture, I grow for two weeks or 14 days or however long my run is. That's one run. At the end of that run, what I need to do is I need to clean my sensor, I need to remove my cap, okay, 
And then I need to make sure it doesn't spill. I need to polish my cathode assembly. How do I polish a cathode assembly? Well, there are these tiny, cute little green polishing cloths that come with these. Okay. They're very, very fine sanding paper. And if you look at the end of these probes, on the very tip, there's a tiny, tiny little dot. That is your platinum. And that gets oxidized very easily. And if it gets coated, it can no longer participate in the redox reaction. So in the palm of your hand, gloved, I just have water, so don't worry about what I'm doing here, but you usually have other stuff on yours. You put just a drop of water and you use the palm of your hand, not a hard surface because you want some give and you put the probe in and you twist it 20 to 30 times. All that does is it removes any oxidation that may have coated your platinum. And at the end of that, this is reusable many, many times. And then you can just very lightly blot the end or rinse this off. Okay. So that is your every single run you want to do that. You had electrolyte left in here. You want to dump that out. You want to rinse this container out. Okay. Rinse this out so that you have nothing in there that shouldn't be. And then you're going to put the correct electrolyte and every manufacturer has a specific electrolyte for their polarographic probes. Always use the electrolyte from the manufacturer of the probe you're using because it was all optimized together. And you're gonna carefully measure in one to 1.2 liters. I don't have my measuring device right now, but you'll measure that in here. Okay, I'm just gonna put a little bit in. You wanna make sure you do not put more than one to one and a half liters. So when you put this in, it will leave a small air gap in here. And again, carefully measure, don't do what I just did. One to one and a half liters. Now that's specific to Hamilton probes. If you have a manufacturer of a probe that's not Hamilton, read the manual that they give and ask them because everybody has a slightly different capacity, but you do not want to overfill the probes because when you autoclave them, we talked about this, too much liquid pressurizes, expands, it only has one place to go and that's out the bottom. And if you burst this membrane cap, you got to start over. Okay. I will also frequently look and visually inspect the end of that cap. I'm a geek, I admit it. I do happen to have a little microscope here and I will actually, it pairs to my phone, I'm not gonna do it right now, but I will actually inspect to make sure there's no micro cracks in the tips of my sensors. Magnifying glasses work really well. If you happen to have really good eyesight, that ship sailed a long time ago with me. Um, so if you have questions, it doesn't matter if they're in the chat or the Q&A, Doug's gonna help me monitor both. So please ask your questions. Anyhow, you do not want too much liquid in there because you do not want it to blow up. Blow up is bad, blow up is expensive, okay? Once you've done that, you visually inspected the sensor cap, you've added new electrolyte and rinsed it out, you've polished your cathode assembly, you're going to hook this probe up to your bioreactor and read a measurement out. And it's gonna give you a nanoamp signal. Acceptable nanoamp signal ranges are between 40 and 80 nanoamps. You really wanna be in the sweet spot in the middle to the high end. If you're doing this and you just basically rebuilt the probe and you're getting a 40 nanoamp signal, remember we talked about the electrolyte will change over the course of a run and it'll read artificially low. If the best you're ever reading is 40 and then you read lower than that, that's outside of the usable range of this probe. So you wanna start as high to the 80 as you can at the beginning of a run because it will drop. Um, if it's below 40 nanoamps, this sensor is not going to survive a full run. 
If it's 50, I would be very cautious. If it's 60, depending on the run, I might not be worried. 60 and above is really where you kind of want to think about it for the Hamilton probes. Um, if it's not, what can you do? You can go back in, you can replace the membrane cap. These get replaced every two to three months. Um, try it again, polish the cathode, fill it with electrolyte, check it again. It didn't go up, huh, all right. The next thing you can replace is the cathode assembly. Um, not all probes allow you to replace the cathode assembly. Some do, so if you can replace it, then you replace the cathode assembly because these will die over time as well. Add the electrolyte, screw it together, check it. It's gonna be better or it's not. Honestly, if you've replaced the cathode assembly and you replace the cap and you replace the electrolyte, you've basically got a brand new probe for all intents and purposes. So if it doesn't work after that, that means there's something wrong in the electrical of the probe and you just need to replace the probe, okay? This does take a little bit of time. These are what we call high maintenance probes. If you do not do this after every run, you will have consecutively and sequentially worse performance. So now I've rebuilt my probe and I'm pretty sure it's going to be good. How do I put it into a run? Well, generally Please, speaking. Um, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Can I, can I ask a question about um, polarization sure. of probes? So, just about to um, do that. <laughs> oh, that's what, okay. So you were, I was, okay. Well, I'll just ask my question anyway. Um, so the, the question is really, what is polarization doing to the probe? That's what I've always been curious. So I'm sure you'll talk about that, but that's my, yeah. that's my question. Great. And Eva, I saw you nitrogen glass with a uh, nitrogen gas with zeroing. We will talk about calibration when we talk about optical. Um, I just do it in one slot towards the end. So I promise I will get to nitrogen gas. So as Doug was saying, how the heck do I get my probe to be usable? This is specific to polarographic probes, okay? So you cannot, once you've rebuilt the probe, put it in and expect it to work. It doesn't. It needs to what we just talked about polarize. Okay. And by polarization, that means we need to connect the probe to the transmitter in liquid for some amount of time to stabilize the current. It's called polarization time. Different manufacturers have different polarization times. Hamilton's happen to be the shortest I've ever heard of, of two hours. Um, there are other probes out there that require up to 10 to 12 hours of polarization. And if you do not let it have its full polarization, it is not stable. So I'm gonna go into that in a second. So it actually doesn't have to be in liquid. Usually what people do though, is they, they shortcut. So I say in liquid, usually what happens is you put your probe into your bioreactor. We're gonna pretend this is a glass bioreactor because we're gonna do a lot of pretend today. You have your pH probes in here. And then most people, put their media in the bioreactor and they put this whole thing with media into the autoclave and the autoclave it. And then they bring it out and they let it cool down. And when they, when it's cooled down, then they hook up the power to their pH probe and their DO probe and they just let it hang out for a while, usually the night before. pH probes need to be in liquid after autoclavation for at least an hour to resaturate the, um, the gel membrane of them. These do not technically have to be in liquid, but it's kind of nice to let them equilibrate in liquid. You just have to have them hooked up to power. And what the polarization does is it's a time that basically burns off the impurities that were generated when you put your cap on, you've handled this in air, you've added your electrolyte, you've handled the cathode anode assembly, you put the membrane cap on. That couple hours allows equilibrium state to happen within the probe so that your um, redox reaction is a nice equilibrium and balance and you've burned off any impurities that you may have introduced. So the only redox reaction that's being performed during that time is the silver, silver chloride, oxygen, platinum combination, okay? Why it takes longer for some probes than others 
is a design thing. Hamilton spent a lot of time designing their anocathode assembly and the specific electrolyte that's in here so that it only takes two hours. Why do I say it should be in liquid? I don't. It's just, you generally don't, pull. it's generally a huge mistake to polarize this, then autoclave it, then put it in the bioreactor because you're out of a sterile environment. So if you autoclave dry in your bioreactor and then you add your media in, that's fine. Your pH probe's gonna need at least an hour anyhow in liquid to be useful. So I'm sort of a lazy person. I like to streamline my processes where I can. So when I have the option of a glass bioreactor and I have all my probes in and I put the media in and I autoclave it together, my pH probes stay with a proper performing gel layer. And I've hooked this up to power after the autoclave and it gets a couple hours and I'm ready to go in a couple hours after autoclavation. I don't have to try and go into a sterile hood to put my probe in because maybe I autoclave this. That's great. Now I need to plug it in, it's still in the autoclave bag, but I've got the power plugged in. Now I have to go into a sterile cabinet after a couple hours and try and add it sterilely into my bioreactor, but I have to break my seal in order to do that. There's always possibility of contamination when you use a sterile hood. So that's why I say it usually has liquid to polarize, but you don't technically need a liquid. So um, once you've polarized it, then you can calibrate it. Um, and we will go over calibration in more detail um, when I, after I talk about optical because they're calibrated fairly much the same way. So instead of doing it twice, I will go over it with optical. Okay. Storage. This became really something that I got asked a lot about last year after COVID and labs were shut down. You want to store these upright if at all possible. And if you're not going to use them for at least 30 days, then you want to remove the liquid in them and store them dry. And then before you use them, you'll wanna add the liquid and do the same maintenance thing. So you'll wanna rinse them off, you'll wanna polish the cap, you'll wanna add new liquid, you'll wanna verify that their voltage is between, or the currents between 40 and 80 nanoamps, and then you'll wanna polarize them. When you store them, you do not want to leave them resting on a surface. You want to always make sure that that membrane cap is surrounded by air so it does not get micro cracks or damage the cap. Okay. And if you're going to store it long term, not only should you remove all the electrolyte, but you should rinse the cap out, just like you saw me do there, um, so that it's clean. Any questions on polarographic before I move to optical? These are the high maintenance and there's huge maintenance and you will laugh when you see the maintenance half a slide for optical because it's pretty simple. So optical, how do we do optical dissolved oxygen measurements? Well, I'm glad you asked. You didn't, but you still have to listen. It's fluorescence. It's really simple, it's fluorescence technology. There is an optical sensor. It has a cap as well. And in that cap is a luminophore. We shine a light on it, the luminophore causes a change, a fluorescent shift. We're gonna talk about that in a little more detail. Within the Hamilton, we have a couple versions of the sensor. I only bring this up because every manufacturer has a couple versions of their sensor and I'll explain why. Remember I talked about polarographic probes just a second ago. Hopefully you didn't forget. It was just briefly ago. Those are electrochemical probes. They have a nanoamp signal. When people wanted to start replacing polarographic with optical, they needed to have a probe that would mimic that nanoamp signal. But they wanted all the benefits and ease of use of optical. So Hamilton uses what's called the VisiFirm ECS probe that mimics the exact same nanoamp signal as a polarographic probe, but it's an optical sensor. And then we have our arc family like this that can give you a four to 20 signal. 
or a digital connection to a PCS or a controller system. When I say digital, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but any sort of digital platform, new bioreactors require digital signals, Modbus, OPC, things like that. The anatomy of these sensors is pretty easy. We have the sensor and there are caps, the whole sensor. The types of caps you have, for Hamilton, we have two different caps. Um, I'm having most people have the same sort of thing. We have our H0 cap, which is compatible with most fermentation. And we have an H2 cap that has a slight Teflon coating on it. It just is a little more robust, lasts a little longer. And depending on what you are culturing and what is a byproduct of your process might give you a little more lifetime and durability. Um, for example, filamentous fungi is something that you will almost always use an H2 cap with because it tends to attack the silicon of an H0 cap. And we'll go into the anatomy of the cap in just a second. So why do people really care about optical oxygen? Why has there been this huge push to move away from polarographic? Well, there's no electrolyte in this. That means you don't have to worry about the CO2 fouling that you find in polarographic probes. Remember we talked about CO2 going across the membrane, changing the electrolyte strength? Doesn't happen, no electrolyte, no polarization. I can literally calibrate this, plug it in and take measurements immediately, no downtime. And the entire maintenance of this probe, unlike the whole rinse it, buff it, polish it, refill it, check it, double check it, do it again. The whole maintenance on this is replace this cap when it goes bad. Oh, and there's a tiny O-ring inside, but that's just for sealing. So um, optical probes are also faster in response time than polarographic. And because there's no electrolyte, I can actually install it upside down if I wanted to. Polarographic probes are sensitive to something called pressure spikes. Now, what's a pressure spike? This does not occur in small benchtop bioreactors. It occurs in big scale up. And big scale of bioreactors have valves and there's a lot of pressure going on in there. And every time you open a valve to add feed or add a bolus or add something, you can experience a small amount of pressure change inside that tank, okay? Polarographic probes membranes are flexible. So when that pressure changes, that membrane that started off like this might do this or it might flex this way. And every time that membrane flexes, if it does not return to the exact shape that it was before, you've changed its responsiveness and its ability to measure. And it's really impossible to make sure it goes exactly to the same. So pressure changes in your vessel might have it do this and stay. Now it's going to read with a slight offset, either plus or minus what it was before. Also, optical oxygen probes are not sensitive to things like H2S or ammonia gas, which in some bioprocess is very commonly found. Uh, H2S is actually a byproduct in the wine industry. It's where you get that stinky wine that nobody likes. And ammonia is sometimes used as an alternative feed in some of the biofuel and some of the interesting up and coming alternative sustainability platforms. So you cannot use a polarographic probe in those because it will actually, the probe is, uh, polarographic probes are, are sensitive to those problems. How does an optical probe work then? Well, basically if you take off the cap, um, there, Cons to optical probes, yes and no. And I'll talk about that a little bit towards the end, okay? If that's okay, Natalie, remind me. Um, there are some cons in cost, but it's actually cheaper to run an optical probe after one year than it is to run a polarographic. And so optical probes, how do they work? Um, inside of the probe, if you take the cap off, there is a laser. LED lasers nowadays, they're low, 
they're low charge or low, low heat and low power, but the laser emits a light. It's a blue light. That light comes out of the laser, comes through and goes inside this cap. Inside of the cap, there's absolutely nothing. At the end of the cap, there is a hard layer of glass. On the outside of the glass, there's a luminophore. And on the outside of the luminophore, there's silicone. The silicone that you see on the end here's only job in the entire world is to block external light from going inside the probe. So the only probe that's measured inside is the stuff that's generated inside. So the light comes out, it goes in, it hits the back of the luminophore. And if there's no oxygen present, the luminophore gets all excited and bounces around. And with no oxygen present, it emits a red light out. Okay, blue light, red light. That's by the way, really close to the way black lights work. So once upon a time, you might've remembered going to a dance club with black light and you see things like that. That's how black lights work. A light comes out, it gets excited, it changes color. But if you have oxygen present, some of that energy from that excited luminophore is absorbed by the oxygen. And you still get red light out, but at a different wavelength, not as much energy, okay? So if we look inside a Hamilton Busy Firm and every probe is similar, there are differences. And I'll talk about those in a second. Inside this cap, there is the blue LED laser. There is that carrier layer. Remember I said there's glass. The luminophore is actually on the outside of the probe. And then there's an isolation layer, silicone. That silicone only allows oxygen and no other gas to go through it to the luminophore. Inside the sealed environment, the blue light comes down, goes through the carrier layer, bounces back. This is where Hamilton is different from any other optical manufacturer out there. Okay. Um, we use a filter to limit the wavelengths of red light that go to the photodiode and we only use a single blue LED laser light. Other manufacturers use two blue LEDs, one that is your standard and one that is your measuring. And they compare the difference between your standard light and your measured light. The problem with doing that is, and here's an example I love to give, you have a lamp right next to your couch where you study and it has two light bulbs in it and they both burn out. You know, one had burnt out a little while ago, you ignored it, the second one burnt out, oh my God, I'm in the dark, I've got to go replace these lights. But I'm energy conscientious now, so I'm gonna replace it with LED lights. So I go to Home Depot and I buy a package of two LED lights, one box, two lights. They came from the same batch. I put those both lights in the lamp, suddenly my room is full of light. Will those light bulbs burn out at the same rate? A year later, two years later, will they both burn out at the same time? In my experience, the answer is no. Lights never age at the same rate. And so if you have two lights built in and one of them is your standard and the other one is your measuring and you're using them to compare, you have to continuously adjust through the entire age of the lights. So instead of doing that, Hamilton goes with a single light and we use a filter. How do manufacturers with two lights do it? Um, Either you have to do a lot of extra calibration and or they limit how long the probe is a lot is, is useful for. They know that so many operating hours after that much, the difference between the two lights is so significant that they say that the probe is no longer valid and must be replaced because they can't control the difference. So it's just something to be aware of as are you using a single light versus a dual light? Um, which one will give you the longest lifetime probe? Um, single lights versions will give you the longer lifetime probe. Okay, so let's look at this again. Remember I told you that that top, if, if I actually take the glass out of the top, there's a layer, the luminophore would be here in pink, and then there's a cover. 
the blue LED emits a blue light. It goes through the glass, hits the back of the luminophore, and it emits a red light. Very simple. Blue light out, red light back. Blue light out, red light back. Blue light out, red light back. Now what happens if the oxygen gets involved and it starts playing? When the oxygen gets involved, you see that red light shifts to a reduced intensity and a different wavelength. Okay. So how do oxygen probes that are optical measure? They actually care not so much about the intensity, but they care about the phase shift. This is where the initial light was. This is where the light with no oxygen was. And this is where the light with oxygen is. Blue light, green light is with oxygen, red light's without. You care about the phase shift. That phase shift is completely correlatory to oxygen. So what does that look like? You can go from zero to 300% saturation by a process only cares about zero to 100. And the phase shift change correlates to the oxygen saturation. Okay. In fact, there's a very large phase shift change for every bit of oxygen percentage here, which means you get a very sensitive, sensitive measurement. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about phase shift. Phase shift is a physical property of the luminophore. The luminophore is a consumable. It will get used up over time. You add light, the luminophore gets used up. You add light, the luminophore gets used up. Those caps have a lifetime. But what's really cool is that the phase shift, if this is your cap lifetime and your luminophore, your phase shift is actually highly measurable way, way beyond the death of your cap. So your cap might actually be down to 50% health. You're still getting a very strong phase shift. That means that these probes can measure on a single cap for a fairly long time. And that means they're robust. So if you happen to have a process that's a seed train or a continuous process that's 60, 80, 90 days long, you can have confidence that your probe is going to be good and in good health and reliable through the entire 60, 90 day process. And that's a little harder to do in a polarographic probe. And it's not always easy to do in other sensors as well. Hamilton also just happens to have a software that gives you a report card on the health of your sensor. So um, it monitors both the light source and the sensor cap quality and gives you a quality warning and it tells you when you need to replace your cap. Just happens to be a convenience. So in theory, optical sensors should be the same. They should give you the exact same measurements as membrane sensors. But in reality, they give you the same numbers, but they're performance is a little bit better. There's less things that can impact the performance, like the, the electrolytes and things like that. They're faster in response time than polarographic, and they tend to be more reliable and better for longer reactions because you don't have to worry about CO2 fouling after a few days. No CO2 interference. And the maintenance. Remember, polarographic, lots of maintenance. This, replace a cap. I'm lazy, I can tell you which one I like. There are two places, however, where polar graphic probes will give you different performance than optical. And I'm gonna give you these examples. So in this example, the blue line is a Hamilton optical probe and the purple line is a polar graphic probe, okay? And it's a seed fermentation. This is around 16 hours and you can see they line up really well. For context, this is in a large 15,000 liter vessel. Okay. This is exactly what you'd hope to see. But in the second run, our customer came back and said, uh, there's a problem. They don't line up. And we started asking them a few questions. And it turns out just around three and a half, four hours, 
where you see this jump in the polarographic measurement, and then it comes down and it settles in the same shape, but with an offset, turns out around three and a half hours, they realized they'd forgotten to add something. And they opened a valve on their tank and they added that back in. Remember what I talked about earlier with big tanks, there's pressure changes and that causes that membrane to flex. The membrane flexed and came back and then measured the same profile only with an offset. And we told them and they're like, I don't know if we believe you. I said, okay, cool. Run it again, only this time intentionally wait and open the valve and do the same thing. And so they did. And this time you'll notice last time there was about a 10% DO saturation. This one's around 40, this one's around 50. The second time they ran it, it changes again and it comes back and the offset difference between these two is about 5%. That's a huge difference in oxygen saturation. And if your system is super sensitive to oxygen, a five to 10% deviation in oxygen could end up with a huge difference in the viability of your population in how much product comes out at the end, all of that, okay? So how do you know if you can trust the control of your sensor? Here's another example. We're gonna put two sensors in a tank, polarographic and optical. We're gonna control the oxygen off the polarographic and we're gonna run this for about two weeks. We're just gonna monitor with the optical, okay? In theory, they should be the same. And this is about what you expect. You get a little wavery because you use oxygen, you add more oxygen, you use oxygen, you add more oxygen, right? So a little waving makes sense. The polar graphic probe looks exactly like the purple, but the optical probe starts going up over time. That's that CO2 fouling we talked about because after five to seven days, depending on your process and how CO2 productive your critters are, you're gonna get fouling in your electrolyte in the polar graphic and you're gonna get a reduced signal. The optical watches this go up. The polar graphic thinks it's stable. How do you prove that? And I don't have a picture to show this, but if I controlled instead off of the optical and I just monitored on the polar graphic, instead of seeing the blue going up, I would see the mirror image of it going down. So here's an example of that in the real world. This was a 38 day fermentation. I apologize for the colors. The green is controlling off of polarographic. And you see it looks very flat. <clears throat> and what they did is they keep it stable and then they do a burst of oxygen, they do a burst of oxygen. So that's how you see these little burst lines, okay? The blue is where they're monitoring the oxygen in optical and it drifts up starting around day five or six. And when they ran this the second time controlling on the optical, they actually watched the oxygen go down in the mirror image that I just talked about. So we're gonna very quickly go through calibration because I promised you would. Calibration is really, 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 really important. And if you do not calibrate your probe correctly you can introduce as much as a 13% error in your measurements. Now, if your critters are seriously sensitive to oxygen, being plus or minus 13% could be the difference between getting a good result and a really crappy result. And if you're in manufacturing, that can equate to millions and millions of dollars and FDA audits, okay? The three things that really do take place um, in air or in your measurement, not at the zero point, zero points only affected by temperature, atmospheric pressure, temperature and humidity. So to put this in perspective, Hamilton probes are manufactured in the Swiss Alps. So are Mettler probes. That means they come brand new to you calibrated in the Swiss Alps. That is a very different atmospheric pressure than our little old California where we're pretty much at sea level. So anytime you get a new probe, you absolutely want to recalibrate it because otherwise you could be introducing an eight and a half to 9% error in measurement. Okay. 
Failing to have stable temperature when you're doing your measurements can introduce another two and a half to 3% error. And failing to take into account humidity can add another 2% measuring error. It all adds up. We're gonna talk about types of calibration first. And this is really important. And this impacts different for polar graphic versus optical. So the first kind of calibration we're gonna talk about is calibration of the sensor itself. This is only possible on intelligent sensors, which are generally optical. Um, intelligent sensors like this, it's an arc sensor, it actually holds the calibration and copies it into the head of the sensor. So I can calibrate this, put it on a shelf, grab it later, autoclave it, and then put it on any bioreactor and it will see the calibration and read it from the sensor. That's awesome, it saves me time. It means I can take and get rid of that 13% possible error. Analog sensors do not have the ability to hold calibration. So we can never calibrate the sensor itself accurately. What we can do is calibrate it, get some numbers, and then put that manually, input that into the bioreactor. But mostly what we do is we bypass it and we just calibrate this to the bioreactor and ignore that the probe ever has calibration. So you pretty much always have some amount of error in your measurements with polar graphic measurements because you can't really compensate for it that well. Okay. So what we're gonna talk about first is how to calibrate the sensor itself. And then we're gonna talk about how to calibrate in a bioreactor because these are the two steps that you will run into in the real world. So zero calibration. How do we do a zero cal? And this addresses your question, Ava. A zero calibration means zero oxygen. So how do you do that? There are two ways. Um, both are completely valid. And this is on the probe itself. It depends on your atmosphere. What you can see in the diagram there is a probe calibration station we have that works on our 225 millimeter length sensors only. Um, I have sort of a version of it here. You take ultra pure 99.999% nitrogen gas. You don't want anything less than that, five nines. And you need to flood the end of your sensor with nitrogen gas for a while so that there's no possible oxygen there. You don't wanna like immediately blanket this with like flowing air because when you take high pressure gas, which in a tank is around 2,340 PSI and you get it down to where you need it, which is two to three PSI, it gets really cold. It's called the uh, Joule Thompson effect. So you wanna have the gas and you wanna bring it into something where there's space between where the gas starts flowing at the two to three PSI and where the probe reaches it. This happens to be a tube that allows this much space. That space means that that gas has time to come up to room temperature and equilibrate. And I would literally put this probe like this and let it hang out in flowing gas for about three to five minutes. And then I would do a zero cal using, I'm not gonna show you how to do this in here, but using the Hamilton software. Um, if, I'm, if you're using Hamilton, if you're doing other probes, they have different software to do a zero cal. And I say, guess what? This is zero cal. And my calibration says, yes, it is. Good to know. You will fail a calibration if the temperature fluctuation on your probe is too much. It has to be a very narrow, like within 0 0.02 degrees Celsius change over that time. But now you're blanketing with it and that's your zero cal. An alternative to that, that is somewhat easier for many people is to use a solution that you make of sodium sulfite in water. You wanna make it up fresh just before you're gonna do this. In fact, last year at Laney, we did this as an exercise and it's one gram of sodium sulfite in 100 milliliters of distilled water and you shake it up really good. And if you have no patience like I do, you also put in one milligram of cobalt chloride because that kicks it up and makes it faster. What that solution does is it basically destroys all the oxygen in the solution. So then you can put your probe into that solution and suspend it. You don't want it resting, but you suspend it. 
and it's a zero oxygen solution. Super simple. Okay. When you do that again in our software, you say, uh, that's a zero cal. And as long as the temperature is stable, it goes, yes, it is. And it writes that value of the phase shift for that into the probe. That's zero cal. Both of those are completely legitimate. Um, it just depends on your facility and what they're going to do. I suspect if you're doing this at Laney, Doug will do it probably with the sodium sulfite just because it's easier. You do not want to use solutions for, you want to make the sodium sulfites fresh every day it, because that solution will pick up oxygen and you don't want to calibrate in an oxygenated solution. How do you do an air calibration? Well, we talk, I've talked several times about taking into account humidity. Air calibrations are super easy. Take a wet towel, not a piece of paper towel, but a good amount of wet rag. Wet it, wring it out so it's just a wet rag. Good amount of volume and you wrap it around the edge of the probe, just like you see in this picture. You put that on the counter, you let it sit for five minutes, you say calibrate. It has to be a certain volume of, of cloth because what happens in a wet towel? It evaporates. Evaporation does what? Temperature change. So if you just did a thin amount of paper towel, it's gonna to evaporate so fast, it's gonna be very temperature unstable. A big rag, super simple, nice and wet, gives you that humid environment that mimics the bioreactor, really simple. It writes it to the rag, or sorry, to the probe. Now we've calibrated the sensor. If you're using intelligent sensors, this is fine. There are actually intelligent arc versions of the polar graphic sensor for Hamilton, as well as the optical. Um, there's reasons you do or don't use both, okay? And again, that feeds into Natalie's why are the pros and cons, which I will address in a minute. Okay, now I've got my calibrated probe. Huzzah, I'm great, I'm fantastic. I'm ready to go to my bioreactor. I've put my probes in my bioreactor. I've autoclaved my bioreactor. It's cooled down to room temperature. So everything's nice and cool because you don't wanna calibrate at a really different temperature and you want stability. Now I'm gonna do my span. So I hook up my cable from my bioreactor to my probe. This is important that you hook it up because you're also gonna be calibrating the cable and any of the electronics and the impedance on that, all of that gets factored in now and it's called a span calibration and it's done in the bioreactor. So I've got liquid in here. How do I do a zero cal if I'm in a liquid environment? There are two options and it depends on the bioreactor. The easiest in the world option on some bioreactors is disconnect. It says, it says, do you want to do a zero cal? You're like, yep. And you disconnect the cable so that your cable is not actually attached to your probe. And you say, there's my zero cal. It's totally legit if your bioreactor accepts it because zero volts is zero volts. And zero oxygen should be what? Zero volts. If your bioreactor allows it, that's the fastest calibration in the world. Temperature insensitive, easy, done. If your bioreactor does not allow this, how do you do a nitrogen or a zero calibration? Well, you purge your bioreactor with nitrogen gas. If you've got media in there, that means instead of oxygen purge, you have to purge with nitrogen gas. 99.999. Five nines. This can be a little time consuming. And the way you do this, there's two possible ways. It doesn't really matter which way you do it as long as the policy is and everybody does it the same way. Okay. You sparge with a specific sparger at a specific stir rate at a specific gas flow rate, five liters per minute or whatever. Okay consistent for some period of time. You've decided for a one liter reaction with this certain media, it should only take 20 minutes to sparge all the oxygen out. And you say, okay, I'm at zero. There's my zero cal. That's totally acceptable. An even better way of doing it, which means you don't have to have a different recipe for every kind of media, is to have your oxygen probe in there reading you're not gonna calibrate yet, you're just gonna read the output and you're gonna sparge with nitrogen and you're gonna have your impellers going with your media. 
And you're gonna watch your oxygen signal go down, 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 and then it's gonna stabilize. And if it stays stable and it doesn't move and it's at the flat bottom, five minutes or so, you're gonna say, that's zero. That may take longer or shorter, depending on the media. Your media might be different depending on sugars and salts and all that, but that way, you're always going to the lowest possible signal out reading that's stable for at least five minutes in temperature and reading. Zero cal. Now we're gonna do 100% saturation. And how do you do that in a bioreactor? Just like you did with the nitrogen, except you're gonna do with oxygen or air purge. Again, you can do it either way, either a set sparge or set time like I did, only you're using oxygen gas or Hook this up, watch it go up until it goes all the way to the top and it's flat and it stays stable for about five minutes and it's, a, you know, it's maxed out. You say, that's 100%. And now you've done your span calibration. Polarographic probes that you cannot pre-calibrate here, um, you might calibrate and write down your numbers later or earlier what your voltages were. When you get to the bioreactor, it may ask you to input that data and then you still do a span and that does everything. Or you may just do a span calibration in polarographic probes. Okay. Any questions on that? Perfect. Yeah, I had a question about uh, one of the things our uh, bioreactor controller gives us on the DO probe is a slope of the calibration. Mm -hmm. So um, I imagine that's probe specific, manufacturer specific, but what are the, what are we looking for? Cause you know, there's actually with pH uh, calibrations, you're looking for a percentage, uh, like a 98% or something like that on your slope um, when you're doing three point, uh, you know, calibrations right. or something like that for DO. No, uh, if it's optical, you need to understand what the quality indicator of your cap and your laser are, and that's gonna be a manufacturer specific thing. If it's polar graphic, I just talked to you about that. Read out the value after you've rebuilt the probe and you should be between 40 and 80 nanoamps. Okay. If you're not like in the mid range to the up range, you need to rebuild until you get 60 to 80 nanoamps because it will drop. Unfortunately for polar graphic, there is no nice, easy way to do it other than just do the 40 to 80 nanoamps. Cause that's usually, mm. bioreactors consider between 40 nanoamps and 80 nanoamps to be an acceptable measuring region for oxygen. Below 40 is not, above 80 doesn't exist. So basically when you're doing a zero and everything, you're basically doing 40 to 80. Okay. So what you need to do is make sure that you're somewhere in the middle to high range on a rebuilt probe. And that's, that, that is your way of testing. I wish I could give you something better than that, but no, that that's, is just that's kind of what it is. Thank you. Okay, no problem. So let's talk for a second about what can affect optical measurements and why I just harped so much on calibration. There are three things that add error to your measurements. The first is aging. There is nothing you can do about it. Your luminophore will get photo bleached and optical. Your caps will get older and polarographic. Your electronics will age. I mean, we all age too. We can't really avoid it. It happens. Your process, you're gonna do autoclavation. You're gonna do steam in place. You're gonna culture critters. They're going to make things. Those also will cause aging and contributions to your measurement error. Uh, you could quit and go farm and then you don't have to worry about this. But other than that, it's not something you can really change. Calibration is the only thing you have any control over. And the best practices you can do in calibration allow you to do the biggest contribution to minimizing error in the measurements. It's the only thing you have control over. So use that. Now, one last thing quickly before I go into it. Um, implementation. For oxygen, the nanoamp signal is nanoamp, it's analog. And that's whether or not you're using um, 
Polar Graphic or a busy firm ECS, which is electrochemical simulator. Those probes, generally speaking, either go to a transmitter that then changes that nanoamp signal into a four to 20 or digital and sends that into your controller system, or they go into an older bioreactor that only reads the nanoamp signal. Okay. Four to 20 is also an analog signal, but it's much more robust. And newer bioreactors either use a four to 20 or a mod bus or a profi bus or foundation field bus. And these are where you have to have an intelligent sensor that allows a digital signal output. Digital is very robust. Um, and within these, you can have maybe one card that controls multiple probes. You can even do Bluetooth connections in these. Um, you can have OPC that goes to a computer type system. You can have Modbus. All of these are really, really robust digital signals that allow you to get more than just a signal. An analog probe only gives you the signal, your DO measurement, uh, maybe as a millivolt, maybe as a nanoamp. It only gives you a pH measurement. It doesn't give you anything else. A Modbus signal can give you the quality indicator, the calibration data, the signal data, maybe temperature data, if there's built-in temperature sensor, it can give you like a full story of data. An analog signal just gives you the results you're looking for with none of the other even available to you. So that is something to think about when you're looking at these as well. When I talk about intelligent sensors, these are sort of the sensors of the future and they're where everything is going. They have no need for transmitters. Everything from a transmitter is built in and integrated into the sensor head, along with the ability to store data and calibration. They give you a much more robust signal because they're digital versus analog. I could bat that cable all day long and it won't even blink at me. Because you can calibrate and know at a glance if your sensor's okay, it reduces a lot of maintenance time. And within the Hamilton platform and other ones have very similar things, you can also use Bluetooth. That's super, super convenient because I can actually, as I'm walking through the lab, see a sensor that maybe has a green light. Green is good, happy with that. Green is fantastic. I love seeing green lights, but maybe it's an orange light or a red light and that tells me something's wrong. I can actually go around the phone and there's free versions of this software and go to my phone and log into the sensor and see its data, see its quality indicator while it's running, calibrate it from my phone if I want to and get full reporting for GMP. And that's the beauty of intelligent sensors. They really streamline a lot of stuff. Now, a couple of questions that came in. Cost effectiveness of polar graphic versus optical. So a polar graphic probe is cheaper up front than an optical probe, which I put down somewhere and I can't find out, but it'll show up. Okay, luckily I had many of them. It is less expensive than this. However, just to give roundabout prices that are not exactly right, a polar graphic probe, let's just say it's a thousand dollar sensor. In one year of, this is really conservative, it's pretty low, consumption, you will need to replace at least this membrane cap three to four times, but every quarter. So you need four caps a year. You will need to replace the electrolyte every single run. Let's just pretend your runs are two weeks long. So you're doing two a month. So 12 a year or 24 a year. You're going to need to replace the cathode assembly roughly every six months with standard use. So the cost of all of that means your annual cost of, and this does not take into account labor. This is just parts. You're gonna look at probably needing to spend about $4,000 for this probe in a year of usage. Conversely, this sensor, which is an optical sensor, might be $2,000 up front. These are not real prices, but they're ballpark, okay? You might need to replace that cap every six months, which is pretty typical. So two caps a year. 
your first year cost of this is going to be right around $2,400 versus $4,000. Your second year cost saying, assuming you don't have to replace the sensor, for two years, you're looking at about, I don't know, call it $2,800 for this. And you're looking at about $7,000 for this. And that does not count labor or downtime due to polarization. So yes, polar graphic are cheaper up front, but all new bioreactors, people are pretty much moving towards optical where they can because it's way less work, way less labor. It's a slightly more expensive upfront cost, but at the end of one year, you could have bought almost two of these for the cost of one of these. But really old bioreactors, this was the only option. And until they came out with the ECS version of the optical sensors, you couldn't change to polar graphic. When else do you still find polar graphic in the world? Um, there are certain processes that are very mean and nasty and eat things. And if they're chemically nasty samples, usually around filamentous fungi, you may have to go with a polar graphic probe because your opticals just won't be stable enough. Um, that's pretty rare, but it does happen. I actually have one customer that does use polar graphic more than anything because one of the byproducts of his process eats, limit, eats the same material that the luminophores are. And he has no choice but to stay with polar graphic. So he has like 40 bioreactors and two of them use polar graphic and 38 of them use optical because he just doesn't have a choice. And then there's manufacturing. If they got FDA approval on manufacturing a drug with polar graphic, it's a lot for them to change to an optical. So there has to be a massive internal use case to make it worth that change. And that was the one question. And then was that you, Doug, about, I don't know if it was you, Doug, or one of the other Dougs, about the calibration slope. You're going to need to, when you get a calibration slope on a bioreactor, you need to talk to the bioreactor company about what that value means. Because um, every bioreactor is a slightly different way that they talk about stuff. And so you need to ask them, how are they calculating calibration slope? Where is that number coming from? What are their expected good ranges? Because the probe manufacturers have our own way of measuring stuff which may or may not have anything to do with the way a bioreactor company gives you that value out. And so that's something that you just kind of need to um, talk to them. So that's all I have and I don't see any other questions. If you have them, please definitely pop them in the window. My contact information is right there and you are welcome to reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, Great, thank you so much, Lee. Uh, that was excellent. I did I have a question. Just had a question come in actually before yours. Oh, from, yes, go ahead. Do you? Okay, I'm probably going to say it wrong, but it, from Dieu yeah. Nguyen, is it possible to feedback a probe readout to an oxygen supply in order to maintain expected oxygen? Absolutely. This happens all the time in bioprocess. In fact, those graphs I showed you. Um, of the polar graphic probes where they were sort of drifting, that was where you used the measurements from your DO probe to feed back the oxygen. So if your oxygen is consumed in drops, you will add more oxygen, either in a continuous bubbling trickle or maybe as um, in boluses. It just depends. Um, but absolutely, if oxygen is too high, then you would do something to maybe you'd stop adding it or you do something that would consume the oxygen. Does that answer your question? But feedback is a very standard thing done with oxygen measurements. Okay, well, I'm waiting to hear. Doug, you also had a question. You're welcome. Yes, my question was about uh, the <clears throat> optical probes and 
through Advent and how that changed bioprocess. Because I hear about companies like, say, Biomarin, which is in our area, that does three month long perfusion bioreactors. And I don't know how that would be possible with a polarographic probe unless they're doing something um, pre optical. I don't know what happened before optical probes, but what did they do to maintain stability? Because they need that for the FDA and the approval of yeah. the drug. So, so um, I can't speak to specifics, but some companies like that, I know for a fact that several of those companies are using polarographic in those processes still. The thing is, they got those processes approved with that drift way long ago. Hmm. And what they do is at the end of their process, and the same thing that you do with a pH probe, at least I'm guessing, I don't know for sure on some of these, but at the end of the process, they know what their, their current was on this before the process started. And then they will measure at the end and they've validated that there's a certain amount of change that can happen. So maybe they start at 80 and they validated that as long as it's not below 60 nanoamps at the end of the process, their process is considered robust. Um, but I will tell you that large manufacturing that uses polarographic does not tend to reuse them. They tend to use these sensors once and it is less expensive for them to throw the sensor out at the end of the run and get a new one than to do all of the maintenance I talked about because they don't want, if they have a probe fail in a run, it's a lot of paperwork to issue to the FDA about why something failed. And so many of those probes are just used in a single use capacity. And one of the big advents in biotech, which is somewhat slowed down right now because of COVID and the huge um, lead times on many of these parts is we're moving away from stainless steel probes at all and we're moving completely towards single use. They are more expensive, but you don't have to worry so much about bio burden because this whole setup is gamma radiated and sterilized. And at the end of it, it's tossed and you're not having to validate that your next one is also gamma radiated and, you know, cause you're not reusing. So that is one of the next advents is going into a single use sort of setup. Um, there's a lot of costs associated with that. For small R&D, that's very unlikely because it's really expensive. Um, unless they have something that's just really difficult to clean up. Um, and right now, because of lead times of being told up to two years to receive products like this, um, because of COVID-19 vaccine manufacturing and things like that, people are going back to steel or glass. But yeah, the advent, there's just a lot less work if you move to optical versus polar graphic. And that's one of the big things is it's a time savings. If I don't have to dedicate one person to spend hours just refreshing my probes after every run and I can have them doing something else, what's that worth to you? And then having an optical probe where I can log into it throughout the react process and see, and I can set limits that if its signal wavers outside of this range in an intelligent probe, and this will now go to orange the minutes out of my acceptable range, and I get an immediate alarm in my system because I'm outside of range, and that allows me to immediately react and prevent it from truly going outside of the range, there is a lot of value in that too, because that allows now proactive and reactive. And that's where manufacturing, I mean, if you look at and I don't know where you guys do in the study, but industry 4.0 and the connectivity and the interconnectivity of everything, that's really becoming a big thing of, they wanna have single points of control for huge factories. And they wanna have everything interconnected and monitored and add in artificial intelligence for auto control of everything. We'll get there eventually, we're not there yet. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Probes can absolutely detect maximum saturation of oxygen in a media. That's why you do your zero and your saturation calibration. And that's why I recommend that you do the um, in bioreactor span, sort of on a, a process version rather than an, a sound, sound version, because every media is slightly different with different salinity and different oxygen. 
So you are saturating and you'll actually see a probe, depending on what's going on with your media, if you really did a good calibration and you're getting 100% and you're usually running your probes around 40 to 60% saturation. But if you are running close to saturation and suddenly you see it say 105%, that tells you that your compensation, unless you've increased pressure in your media, that suggests to you that your media itself has changed. So it's dissolution of oxygen has exceeded that 100% that you calibrated. And that doesn't mean it's not a good reading. It just means that it's above where that saturated 100% was and it will read that. Technically these probes can read up to 300% saturation. I won't go into exactly how that happens, but it definitely involves high pressure. Thank you so much for attending today. It's been my pleasure to speak with you about dissolved oxygen measurements in bioprocess. If you have any questions around dissolved oxygen theory and practices, the PAT initiative, anything around maintenance on polarographic probes or optical oxygen measurements, I am happy to help you. My contact information is right here. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn and reach me there if that's easier for you. I look forward to speaking with you soon and continuing our conversation.